She won most talkative in high school, and she has been running her mouth ever since. Welcome to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast with your host, Lisa Fisher. Okay, just the name of the book is intriguing, Daniel. So tell me, um, you're going to tell me your story. I saw you on Dr. Ken Berry's YouTube channel, which kind of split the world in two with over 100 <laughs> thousand bazillion views in 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> but you have a great story, but you have a book that accompanies it. So the book title is Unholy Trinity. So without sounding sacrilegious, you'll have to explain to me what that means, how you got to that name. Well, I wanted, I would first come up with things like the evil triad and, uh, you know, <laughs> that isn't, this is, I gotta, this is evil. And I um, thought, well, having grown up a Catholic, uh, I knew about the Holy Trinity, and this is certainly yes. no reflection upon that area right. at all. Of course, I said, what would be the reverse of that? Well, the unholy Trinity, right? And its subtitle is How Carbs, Sugar, and Oils Make Us wow. Fat, Sick, and Addicted, and How to Escape Their Grip. How Carbs, wow. Sugar, and Oils Make Us Fat, Sick, and Addicted, and How to Escape Their Grip. And the reason I wrote the book is because. Okay, so about four years ago, I almost died of a heart attack. And it was a completely shocker because I was Mr. Healthy. That wasn't supposed to happen to me. And I was a lean, symptom free guy. And, wow. I go, and, you know, very early on in my life, I was, um, well, I think I told you I'm just a lower class street kid from Philly. <laughs> But he, I he, also, I'll have to tell people, he emailed me that and it made me laugh out loud. No, he knows that I have Newark, New Jersey roots. So uh, that's, that's kind of local enough, yeah. humor, but I totally, I'm tracking with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. But fortunately, when I was young, I, um, I learned how to study well. Yep. Um, and I learned to be expert in dictionaries. And, um, mm -hmm. but I had to be interested. You know, I wasn't just, if it was a topic I was interested, I could learn it. Because, gotcha. you know, the dictionaries would really help out. Nowadays, we have the internet, you know, you have your Siri. Hey, mm -hmm. Siri, what's the definition of the word, I don't mm -hmm. know, catheter or whatever. You come across a word, you got to look it up. Otherwise, that sentence, you're not going to understand. Your paragraph, you're not going to understand. Then you get to the bottom of the page and you go, what did I just read? And you got to go back and find out where you went off. It's painstaking sometimes, but the more you do it, the less you have to do it. So anyway, I had the heart attack. And I decided to take a dive into the medical and nutrition science to find out how could this happened to me. And so what I discovered absolutely blew my mind and uh, really infuriated me because I found out that what we've been told to eat for decades is killing us. And, I, and it was just a shock to me because I had just passed a stress test. I had, you know, it was... It was all these things. How come my trusted doctors didn't, couldn't see any of this? And then I find out, and I covered this last week. It was this incredible question uh, with Dr. Barry. And in fact, it was like exactly a week ago today. It was 11 a.m. whenever on last Wednesday. And it was something like, how is it that you, Daniel Trevor, a non-physician, were able to figure this all out? When 99% of medical doctors can't or won't. <laughs> so I'm thinking, wow, what a question is that? And so uh, we kind of explore that a little bit. But anyway, so I did take, take the deep dive. I found out what happened to me. And I thought, I have to share this with the world. And so I wrote the book. And it's basically a how-to book because I, in my explorations and all my tests, after I had that, I knew, I found out about all these tests. I went to Google University and YouTube University, found all these geniuses that are on the cutting edge of modern medical science. And uh, I thought, I got to get some of these tests. And so I knew I was going to have a bad report card, but I wanted to find out where I was in everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so what I found out was I was a raging type 2 diabetic. I was under the I was under the impression that you had to be overweight or obese because even the right. CDC says the first sign of of having type two diabetes is that you're overweight. I didn't. Right. I never had that problem. But um, so um, I took this test and I found that out, and then and then I found out that that was the root cause source of my cardiovascular disease. 
And my root cause source of my non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because I don't drink, drink, do don't no drugs. I'm already silly enough, as my daughters will surely attest. And my osteoporosis. And by writing, doing all the research, and um, I was able to in this how-to book with all the research and what I wrote, was able to reverse all four of those things. And I make so it are clear you? Wait that, a minute. Are you, are yeah. you saying you had osteoporosis? Yeah. It starts very early. I have a whole chapter on that, osteopenia and osteoporosis. Yeah. There's a new study that came out that they're showing that it's arriving. The study was something like, something about how these osteopenia and osteoporosis is, are, is showing up in 35 to 50 year olds. In and men? I, and men and women. You guys get it worse than us and more frequently. Yeah. I cover all of this in the book. And- in the beginning of the book, I tell the reader, I said, look, I know you're probably thinking uh, without medical degrees and uh, organic chemistry and so on and so forth, why the hell should I trust you? I say, look, don't. My book has more scientific references and citations than any other book out there. Most of them, if they have any, they're two or three hundred. Mine has twelve hundred and twenty seven. So I say just. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I know I did the, I went the extra mile and did that because I knew I had to have that backup. So I just say, look, just think of me as a friendly relay point of the best of the most modern 21st century science that it has to offer for your health and longevity. Trust that and fix yourself. I did. And you can too. So what, I wanted what is to get your, the- what's your career in? Like what, what have you spent the last 30, 40 years? doing of your in your life well i've been mostly a, an entrepreneur all my life i used okay. I always had some kind of a company but early on uh from the time of about 15 to my mid to late 30s i was in show business oh. and uh and i worked a lot i mean that's awesome it was uh, music and acting back and forth you know i'd have a you know a music group and then a record deal and then a concert tour and then a Broadway show and then a, you know, TV soap opera. And then this it just music and acting back and forth for a long time. And I worked a lot, right. but after, uh, you know, a lot of singles, doubles, triples, but no home run. Right. <laughs> I thought, I'm giving this up. So I went into uh, business and, uh, found out I did pretty good at that and, uh, was always studying technical data. Um, the big company that I had was a high tech um, CTI company, computer telephony integration. It grew to over 300 employees. And, and then I, um, I went into other things and, and so like that. Uh, but yeah, so I'm used to studying technical data throughout my life. And that's why uh, I was able to take the dive into the medical and nutrition science. But you didn't have a medical background, but it shows you don't need one to do the research because you can get it for the low, low price of free on the World Wide Web. That's what, I, that's what I'm telling you. I'm t- you have to be able to, look, I can read a scientific study just as well as any medical doctor. I may have to look up a lot more words because yep. they've already I learned those in medical yep. school, um, you know, in organic chemistry and biochem and all that. And so, you know, but when I had the heart attack, I was never more highly motivated to find out and discover something that I then then. And so I took the dive and found out all this information. Well, Daniel, tell me what your symptoms were for a heart attack. Because truthfully, since it's not even in my nomenclature, I don't even think about it. I'm not a candidate. <laughs> I'm not signing up for it. I don't know much about it. I know there's chest pain and there's chest pain. So what else you got? No, that's the Hollywood version where they grip the chest and there's right. chest pain. <laughs> Right. And, um, there are different types of symptoms, and you gals even have it a little different too. I um, I was. It was early one Saturday morning, and I started feeling some pain and well, some kind of sensations in my in my throat area, kind of like what you yeah. might feel at the beginning of a cold or a flu, that kind of thing. And I and but I knew this wasn't an ordinary case of sniffles because. Soon came the cold sweats. So I thought, what's this? Oh. So I rushed to Dr. Google, asked Dr. Google, and I'm looking down this list of heart attack symptoms and I'm going, checking them off. No, 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 no. And then I get the cold sweats. 
And I was very lucky because at the time I was, I had, my daughters had just gone off to college and I was living by myself and I had, was, had this, took this um, top floor unit in this brand new high rise. And it was right across the street from one of the top destination heart hospitals in the country. I oh, mean, wow. there were never any screaming ambulances because it was, they didn't have really a trauma unit. They had a tiny right. emergency room. So I grabbed my wallet, put on a shirt, went down, walked a hundred feet across the street. <laughs> and I saw the first nurse I saw, I said something like, I, I think I might be having a heart attack. I don't know what's going on. So she took me in, they drew some blood uh, to check for this uh, protein that's called troponin, along right. with a 12 point EKG. And in <laughs> it would seem like a few minutes uh, came a positive for myocardial infarction, which is, is a positive right? for a heart attack. I thought, what? So I immediately texted my daughters and because uh, it was a Saturday morning, they arrived very quickly. And, um, you know, it started like that. And then I decided to take all the research to find out how, how this could happen to me and I need to reverse it and all that kind of thing. So that's the uh, short so but yeah to get the full story you got to read my introduction i understand that there. but <laughs> i understand that all right we, we, and we the carrot will dangle for the the listeners but we do have to give them some information and all this no, no, information no, no, will, no. will be in the show notes yeah listen and also i want to say that you know you're like the third or fourth person that i've interviewed with about this so i'm so rough around the edges try not yeah, to hold no. it against me so i have one yeah, request no. just you're doing great. Well, let me ask you a, a couple of things from the point of a layman having a heart attack who walks across the street from his high rise and in bingo, you get the diagnosis. Do they send you home then or do they do you get hospitalized after a heart attack? I truly don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You get hospitalized right okay. away. Oh, yeah. That's uh, immediate. Do they put and you then, through the cath lab and start looking oh, at everything? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's what that, yeah. So. Um, and you want to avoid that at all costs, especially these, um, what do you call them? The stress tests, because right. if you're not having symptoms and you're okay, your doctor might go, okay, you're at about the age we should have a stress test and a stress test. The problem with them is that you can have a normal reading and then have a heart attack and die. That's what happened to, there's so many people. There's, um, who is the newscaster? Why is that? Explain that to me. That, I will. That's fascinating. Let me give you some examples first. Okay. Um, Tim Russert, he, had, he was a well-known- Yes. He had this yes. Sunday morning show called Meet the Press. That's right. And he was in the studio the day before, and he passed out and had a heart attack and died. Right. Uh, what's his name? Gary Shandling, the comedian and actor. Yes. And yes. he was only 66. He passed his stress test. Oh, by the way, Tim Russert passed his stress test too. This is the point is of I'm giving right? you this, I'm giving you these examples. Gary Shandling, okay. that guy from the old rock group uh, Monkeys, was named Davy Jones. He passed yep. his stress test. And yep. He also was only sixty six. Like, so that's um, a real misleading diagnostic oh, yeah. tool. And I'll tell you why. And also Alex Trebek, game show host. Yes. Yes. He passes stress test. <laughs> he had a heart attack. He survived it, but un unfortunately he was taken by pancreatic cancer a year or right. two later, sadly. Um, so, so many people, I mean, if you can imagine if celebrities with the best medical treatment that money can buy that happens to them, you can imagine how much it happens to other people. The reason for that is this, and I have all this in the book. I have a whole section, section where I dive, dive deep into uh, cardiovascular disease and heart attacks and strokes and all that in chapter 17, 18, 19, 20. And I, it's written for the average reader of health and wellness. So don't, don't back off. It's, it's okay. Cause I, um, you know, I told, uh, Dr. Ken Berry, he's, his book is written for the average for, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write it for, let's say uncle Joe or my brother, Dave, who, you know, they're not technically oriented. So I want to write it for the average person so they don't have to be, I mean, I'm not writing this for scientists or doctors, even though doctors need it more. Here's the deal with the stress test. When you do a stress test, in order to, to detect any potential problem, 
you have to show at least 50% blockage in the arteries, right? At least 50%. However, the problem is that over 70% of all the heart attacks that occur, occur with less than 50% oh. blockage, right? And so you're missing all that. So that if they could come up with a stress that could detect 25%, 35%, 45%, but it has to be well over 50% to detect the set. You know, so I'm thinking like, what are we doing here? How come I know this now with all the research I've done? <laughs> and these, but look, the stress test, after you do that, the, the doctor will say, well, you know, I'd like to take a closer look. And what that means, they want to take you in the cath lab. And before you go in there, you have to write, sign a form that gives them permission to, hey, if I get in there, I, I'm going to put a stent if I want to. Mm -hmm. And they're like a hammer looking for a nail. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to wind up with the, I call it the wicked triangle. It's that section in chapter 17 where you have the stress test, the, uh, the calf, and then the, the, the catheter lab, and then the, uh, the stent. Anyway, so you're going to miss a lot of people. And that's what happened to me. I passed my stress test with flying colors, uh, but I still had the heart attack and almost died. But, um, but fortunately- So did they do a stent on you? Yes. Yes. Okay. And stents and I know are only useful in 15% of the time. 85% of the time, uh, 80, 80, no, let me put it this way. 85% of all the stents that are installed with this process called PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, Yes. Are done on people with stable heart. They're not having a heart attack. There's no emergency. And so 85% of them are really unnecessary because they could fix it with our intermittent fasting and with our diet oh. and everything like that. And only 15% okay. of all stents are uh, installed because of an emergency situation. Now, believe me, they are life saving in certain situations in an interventional uh, cardiologist situation where they have to come in and do that. That's what happened to me, because the longer you wait before you get to the ER and get some help, um, part of the muscle, heart muscle starts to die. And when it starts right. to die, it's not coming back. So right. that's why they call that the golden hour. Mm -hmm. Every time you, the more time you linger before getting yourself to the ER, that's what's happening. So you don't want to delay. If you get any kind of weird symptoms or you're sweating unusually, just feel odd. Go there. See what happens. I mean, it's, you Did know. you have the nausea or any of those no. things? No, just I thought I was coming down with a cold or flu. And then that's, I got the cold sweats. That's crazy. Okay, well, yeah. let me ask you this. Now, Dr. Ken Berry, I know his philosophy on this, but I know everyone who is a patient um, as a cardiovascular patient who's had an event like you have, has the dreaded words of, you have to be put on a statin. So tell me what your cholesterol was and is and what your philosophy is on that and, and where you are today on that. Oh, man. Well, I have high cholesterol and high LDL. I'm what you call, and you probably heard, you probably know, I'm sure you know, I'm what you call a lean mass hyper responder. And mm -hmm. what that is, it's a person who has, who's lean, muscular, athletic, physically fit, mm -hmm. high HDL, which is the good cholesterol, mm -hmm. you know, lean uh, waist circumference, no pathological, metabolically very healthy, mm -hmm. but their LDL is way high. It, mm -hmm. it, you know, that was, that's me. And so of course it's high enough to make any car, any cardiologist or doctor, the ones who don't know what we know, mm -hmm. want to faint, say, Hey, mm -hmm. and they don't understand that the studies show that the high people with high cholesterol live the longest people with low cholesterol die much earlier and usually of some form of cancer. I mean, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. and who has the lowest cholesterol is vegans and vegetarians. I mean, not to condemn them because they're way ahead of most people insofar as trying to improve their lot. Well, it's not health. condemning it's facts. We've got to stop apologizing because we may offend somebody where all we're doing is relaying science didn't they tell us in 2020 to trust the science there's a <laughs> nature.com study before that that said um the highest mortality rate people with the lowest cholesterol and as it's i mean we know what it does to the brain dementia 
is low cholesterol causes dementia. You need you need the fat and the lipids and stuff for your neurotransmitter. Your exactly. I have, I have so, some I have some data and some quotes from Dr. David Perlmutter, which I'm who I'm sure you know. Love neurologist him. and uh, New York mm-hmm. Times bestselling author, and he's just brilliant. Mm-hmm. And he says, "Look, the brain needs cholesterol. Mm-hmm. You have to have it." And oh, there was a more recent study. I think it was just last year, and it talks okay. about how people that abstain from meat are way at, at a much higher risk of dementia, depression, and all these other mm-hmm. things. And that's probably because meat is the most nutrient dense food that there is and the b vitamins that it has mm-hmm. that's well known mm-hmm. that to uh, accelerate your brain cells and that kind of thing and then as you also know the intermittent fasting uh inc- I have a whole chapter on that everything you need, well, need to know about intermittent fasting is in chapter eight and that well, causes this thing as you good. know B- bdnf brain derived neurotrophic factor because the brain loves ketones way more than glucose or any other kind of energy. That's what it prefers, it sh- right? It prefers. That's why you get more energy. Your mm-hmm. heart and your brain will choose ketones over anything else any over second gl- of the glycogen. day. Over glycogen. That's right. So <laughs> exactly. tell me, um, you were this lean mass uh, hyper responder. I am. But you'd yeah. never, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't really rip the Band-Aid off with intermittent fasting until you see that it has health benefits since you didn't have a weight issue. Had you tried intermittent fasting before your cardiovascular event? No, I just discovered it because, uh, because I never really had a weight problem ever. Right. And, um, and so I just saw all the science and how, what the benefits people were getting from it. And then I discovered all the, uh, it's just, it does so much for your cardiovascular system Mm -hmm. and, and what I also found, and and to your point, I didn't jump into all of it at the same time. And I don't advise that. It's just too much. You can't. You got to get used to the intermittent fasting first, and do it gradually. Do twelve hours, and then do thirteen and fourteen. What I like to tell people is, is look, if you're the average person that's eating three times a day and three or four snacks a day, the first thing you have to do is eliminate the snacks. Right? Those they got to go. Start by eliminating yep. one. And the best and easiest way to get from one meal to the next without a snack is you have to load it up with high healthy fats. We're talking grass-fed, pasture-raised, eggs, yep. beef, s- salmon, butter, and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that will, it's, it's very satiating because mm-hmm. carbs are not satiated. Carbs do not Mm-mm. satisfy appetite. Mm-mm. They stimulate it. That's right. Yeah. And people don't realize that. So let's go back to your statins. Um, I know you were prescribed them. Uh, how compliant are you? Oh, geez. Well, there's a whole thing about that. I had gotten um, a high dosage of atorvastatin, which is Lipitor. And that made me feel like I had uh, gauze wrapped around my head. I've I heard. I had it. I've heard probably it's really bad. 30 IQ, IQ points. Mm-hmm. And see, hey. You know, when you hear uh, advertisements from Big Pharma, whether it's on TV or wherever, and it says, oh, this is going to drop your, cole- uh, your uh, what is it? You'll avoid risk of heart attack by 50%. What they give you is, it's a, they, they fudge the numbers. Let's say huh, they have- Really? A, huh. eh, no, this is how they do it. Well, there's a thing called absolute risk and relative risk. Right. And let's say they have two groups of people. One group is uh, 2,000 people and one group uh, at 1,000 is given a satin and the other one's given a placebo. Right. And so that's, you know, and then after two or three years, they follow them. And in the statin group, we have no deaths, but in the non-statin group, we have one death. Or actually, I'm sorry, two in the non-statin and one in the statin. So what they say is, well, one Mm -hmm. is 50% less than two. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? I mean, it's just amazing, you know? And that's when you see these uh, ads on TV with, uh, you know, right out of central casting, the doctor with the right Mm -hmm. hair and Mm -hmm. 
you see <laughs> the boomers playing basketball yeah. with the kids and like That's that right. and it's all happy right. and so on. But what they don't tell you is that the actual, it's called absolute risk reduction and, and mm-hmm. relative risk reduction. Now, the absolute risk reduction, it's a tiny amount. It's like less than 1%. Mm. But they go with the relative risk reduction. I even ask mm-hmm. in the book, that how, you know, that's why scientists, who really serious scientists, how can they look them straight in the eye knowing this information without scratching their head saying, what's going on here? And then I also cover the fact that Oh, what is it? Um, there was a big study. It was 92, 90, I'm sorry. Yeah. 92 studies, a meta analyses of do statins pay? The researchers wanted to know, do statins make us live longer or what? You know, and what they found, was, this was shocking. They found that and I have this in, I have on my website, DanielTrevor.com. I have this in my video. I have a seven minute video up there. And they, they wanted to know, does it extend your life months, years, decades? And the results were shocking. Was it four and, days? Well, yeah, the group in the, yeah, it was, they extended the group. They, by taking <laughs> statins, they extended their life three days longer. Well, there was two groups. And, One and group, it was after five years of, you, of taking you the statin every day. There you go. And what it is, just to clarify a little more, one group was um, a group with, uh, they were taking it for primary prevention. In other words, no heart attack yet. And they lived a big three days longer than those in the other group. And the second group was, they had, it was for secondary prevention for people who already had a heart attack. And they lived a big four days longer. So I asked my, you know, I asked the my reader in the book, you still want to put up with the nasty side effects from taking statins because they can be pretty nasty. Everything from road rage to, uh, it's just pretty terrible. Well, the the current administration, not that this is a political show, but he shakes hands with the air, Mr. Biden, and his list of medicines when he had COVID last year was he's on a statin. Is there a correlation? You do the math. Again, this is not a political conversation, but it's you will see it with people, well, ask anybody who's on a statin. And of course, this is not medical advice that I'm giving you at all. I'm just, this is what I want people to do. Do the research and you decide your body, your choice. And that's including with your cardiovascular surgeon or your cardiologist or whoever, your interventional uh, cardiologist, whoever advises you, just say, you know what, I'm going to do some research and see what's best for me and do it and be confident. So you're not a compliant patient. That's obvious. <laughs> Tell me now what kind of relationship you have with the provider. Have they told you there's the door? We don't want to treat you or are people, <laughs> hey, it's happening all the time with people who are refusing chemotherapy and radiation. They're saying there's the door. So how does a cardiologist deal with a rogue patient who's writing a book and telling them, hey, cut out the crap and then you'll cut out the risk of heart disease? You know, I don't even have a primary physician right now because I, I know how it. to read all my labs. Right. I, I, I totally I have agree. become expert at that. And I really don't need the cardiologist, even though I have one, just in case of whatever, just to consult. Yeah. And he doesn't even know that I wrote the book yet. I have an appointment with him <laughs> next week. I'm going to give him the book. And when he sees my, you know, the back cover with all these endorsements from like Dr. Philip Ovedia, who's a I love cardiac him. Sp- cardiac surgeon who's done over 3,000 heart operations. I mean, I have some heavy duty people that have endorsed the book. And then I also have, um, well, anybody can learn this stuff. I asked Dr. Ford Brewer, who is out of Johns Hopkins. He's taught thousands of doctors over the years. I asked him to write my, uh, he's got a great uh, YouTube channel. And I asked him to write my chapter 22, which is basically what are the most important blood labs and scans that anyone can get oh. because your doctor will tell you, oh, you don't need that. You don't need that if he requested from him. And the only reason he's saying you don't need it is because he wouldn't know how to interpret it anyway. That's he, just, he just doesn't have the knowledge to, you know, so it has all yeah. that in there. And you can buy them inexpensively online without needing a doctor's prescription. That right. way, and, and it works. Is it's really easy. That way, you you yourself can find out if you got something lurking inside that 
is kind of similar to mom and dad and what they had and so forth, or you're just fine or somewhere in between that you need to put attention on. And so um, it's real simple. You, I put it all in the book where you can buy them. You go online, you know what to ask for because of the chapter. You give them your credit card, you get an email and you get a form to print out. You take the form to the local, it's either LabCorp or Quest, which right. have thousands of locations around you know the United States as well as overseas. And they do the draw. And then within a couple of few days, you get the results, you know, easy peasy. You get a better picture. You're saying, Daniel, you get a better picture than what Big Pharma, because as we know, Big Pharma supports our medical professionals. And that's why they order what they do, because there's a drug made for that. But you're saying you look at some other things that will tell you, will give you a better picture. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Your ordinary standard garden variety doctors, not, and I don't want to bad mouth them or anything because, and you're you know, not. thank God they're there because it's just, absolutely. you know, my older daughter, Chloe, is uh, works in the ER. She studied at Loma Linda Medical University. And I talk to her about this stuff all the time, you know, people that she's seeing in the ER and all that. But, uh, you know, thank God they're there to uh, set the bone, to, uh, you know, suture up the wound, to uh, absolutely to remove the bullets and steering wheels from our chests. I, <laughs> and I totally thank agree. thank God they're there. A, a big hug for all of them. And so, uh, but when it comes to nutrition and the biochemical area, they're pretty clueless. They don't keep up. And, yeah. you know, I can understand they're not taught any of it. They in are. medical school. And I think some of them have the mentality. Dr. Ovidi and I explore this as mm-hmm. to, you know, why this is. I think some of them get to a point where they might think, well, if they didn't teach it to me in medical school, I must not need to know it. It's not <laughs> right? important. Well, see, that's <laughs> where a group of women, my age women who say same thing, menopause is not taught in medical school. So this group of women, and we're a powerful force. Yes. Um, that's what we're mad as heck and not going to take it anymore. It's the fact that we do exist, even though you weren't taught that, but we are a, you know, a thriving part of the community. Okay, let's talk about diet just a minute. Wait, 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 Tell wait, wait, me- very, wait, very yes, importantly, sir. I need, because you brought it up. One of the other things that you guys, more women need this information than, than the men. Well, not, I don't want to say that. You both need it. But- Women have to realize that, um, and this is only known by, I don't know, almost no medical doctors and cardiologists, only about, what is it, 17% of cardiologists know that more women die from heart disease than men. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it's I didn't a myth realize that it was it's that the other much. way around. Most people think it's the other way. Oh, <clears> it's the men. Women have, what is it, 10 times more deaths from heart disease than breast cancer. So wow. it is something, you know, I have all this in the book with, with and again, I don't, anything I say in the book is backed up with scientific references. So none of this is Daniel's opinion. And so that you gals need to really get yourself to the ER. If you suspect any kind of weird thing going on, um, you know, you got to get there because more see, women are. We, we look at root cause in this medical community I'm in. And if women look at the root cause, often with women over 45, it's uh, they need they need bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, and they often have low thyroid, which contributes to cardiovascular disease. So if we look at the root cause, and women can start supplementing, and they can, and I know some people have, it is not something they would consider. I'm sorry for you because my life is wonderful. Uh, having bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, but also helps my heart. So I, you know, when, when people ask, well, what are the benefits of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy? Mine for, you know, for women, I say it prevents dementia and it can prevent breast cancer and it can prevent cardiovascular disease. So if you look at root cause, part of the root cause is definitely diet, but it's not going to be for me because I don't eat carb sugars and I mean, I might have a carb or a sugar, but I don't have any of the seed oils for sure. But it's also it's just for women being proactive. You are important. You are valuable, and de- and taking care of yourself. Okay, now let's switch over to diet and what has changed in your life. You probably ate a standard American diet. 
um, living it up there in Southern California, going to the beach with your surfboard, but you were going to grab a corn dog and, you know, a hot dog at the hot dog stand that's cooked in seed oils. Tell me what's changed. Oh my God. Well, I found this thing called low carb and keto. Yeah. So that was my first venture. I'm not carnivore. I'm close to it. I like to say instead of plant-based, I'm animal-based. I'm definitely keto. uh, keto. I keep my carbs well below um, 40 grams a day or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't need it. Because, you know, keto is also known as the never hungry diet. You don't get hungry because of the ketones. Mm -mm. They lower appetite. Especially specifically this hormone called ghrelin, which is, as you know, know. is the appetite. Yeah. It's the one that says eat now, right? <laughs> as opposed to the leptin, which is the one that says, okay, you're full, push away from the table. And you get to control both of those real well. And what's really alarming is the other unholy trinity, I call it, big food, big pharma, and big medicine. And believe me, I'm sure there's wonderful, beautiful people in all of them. But at the top ranks, it's more about profits over people. Mm -hmm. And big food, um, you know, in their corporate offices around the world, they have these biochemical geniuses figuring out, okay, so what ingredients can we put into our products that uh, make them crave it more? Right. You know, it's like, oh my God. So I don't hold it against people that have these cravings. That's why the subtitle is how carbs, sugar, and oils make us fat, sick, and addicted and how to escape their grip. And so you have to start cleaning out your pantry. But I don't encourage everybody to do it so fast. If you're going to start, like I said before, the intermittent fasting, start with 12 and then move it to 13 and 14. And, you know, there's, I have different tips and tricks of how to do that. Besides adding fats to get between each one, eliminate one snack. And then once you've re- eliminated all three snacks, if you're used to having three, uh, then you go to the try to go two two meals a day. And yeah. I try to get in 18 hours. And I, again, I, and the other thing, see, go, doing all this, the low carb, the intermittent fasting. And then the third thing that I added in, which is also very ancestral, because that's, you know, let's face it, these bodies are used to maybe eating once a day, if that, if they mm-hmm. were lucky, our ancient ancestors, mm-hmm. right? And uh, it was low carb, the word, We didn't have bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, chips, pretzels, rolls, pizza, and then the uh, candy cake, ice cream, pastries, and so on and so forth. That wasn't able to be picked off a tree, Mm. right? Mm -mm. And then with the seed oils, it's, oh my God, those were, those are just so dangerous. And I have a whole chapter on that too. That's still blowing my mind how dangerous they are. How that is, with our, how, how that is pushed through. Uh, with the American Heart Association, Heart Healthy on canola oil and some other yeah. things. And you see how much money the American Heart Association and the canola oil producer. I mean, you, you just you we just say this all the time. Follow the money. But I think I feel like the tide is turning that people are saying, you know what? Carbs can be, you know, processed, ultra processed foods can be bad for you. Now, if you want to uh, my my daughter in law is from Brazil. She has more of a carb diet than we do. Because she was raised on beans and rice and um, plantains and some other things, which is really fascinating. She's she's the size of this pen. You know, there's nothing to her. (laughs) But she's come to the U.S. and things are things probably taste different to her. But I'm surprised that we still have people out there hanging the banner high for industrialized seed oils that are really primary lubricants from World War II, like. That shocks me more than anything. Like, who thinks this is a good idea? You know, they didn't even exist until 1865. And vegetable seed oils were used as machinery lubricant. Right. In the Industrial Revolution of the late 1800s and early 1900s. They weren't even meant to be in the diet. It happened about 100 years ago. And uh, they looked at a bucket of it and said, hey, it looks like lard. Let's meet, let's feed it to people. Maybe we can make some money that wow. way. Yeah, and then right. by 1911, it started flying off the shelves into in the form of what was called Crisco. Yeah, Crisco. And then they found out in the 90s that it's double trouble for the heart because it has so it's just loaded with trans fats. 
And what's crazy is pork lard is really, if you can get authentic pork lard, it's delicious. And that's how certain cultures still fry some things. Okay, let me, we've got about four minutes left. So I want to kind of wrap things up. One thing I need to know. So those of us in the intermittent fasting community and follower, I'm a follower of Dr. Ben Bickman and Jason Fung and anything I know I've learned from them or Jen Stevens. Fasting Perfect. insulin is really kind of the, I, I, I mean, I talk about the smoking gun of our health. And that's the one thing not checked that even a slim guy like you could have a high fasting insulin. And that is a predictor as well as high sensitivity CRP for a cardiovascular event. Do you know what your lab numbers were before and what are they now? I know what they are post because like I said, okay. I found out about now all these things. And the C-reactive protein, you can get a false, pos- a false negative on that. So the other ones that you want to check for sure, and I have all this in the book, is MPO, which is myeloperoxidase. That's I cover okay. all this in chapter 19, I think. Um, and uh, LP plaque 2 and this one called microbiome creatinine ratio. You don't have to write okay. them down or anything, but they're because they're all there. Right. And those are so important that those can really detect. I call these the smoke detectors because they, okay. they detect the inflammation in your arteries because that's what's hyperinsulinemia, which is just a fancy word for uh, hyper blood pressure. Much insulin. Anemia yeah. means in the blood. So hyperinsulin, too right. much insulin in the blood. That's what starts the internal inflammation, your right. arteries. And that's why they discovered back in the 70s and 80s, what was his name? Dr. Uh, Dr. Joseph Grant, Kraft. And he had done thousands of autopsies and he found that, what was his, his quote was something like, those who have heart disease that, but are not associated with type 2 diabetes are simply undiagnosed because you can't have right. heart disease without be having some degree of uh, diabetes, a diabetic physiology. Isn't that fascinating? It's amazing. That is so fascinating. The, the, the greater, you know, the don't look at your cholesterol, please beg your provider for the, the lab test you're talking about. Definitely fasting insulin. Dr. Mark Hyman likes it at five or six. Mine's like at 2.2 or three. Mine's extremely low. Um, yeah. Yours, yours probably is too. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, and you know what? It, Dr. Fung talks about it, but throw in a longer fast for anyone listening right now. You're thinking, but I'm slim. What do I need? Well, you don't know the inflammation from your heart because you, you know, cumulatively what you've eaten and what you've consumed through your life and stress and toxins and smog and stri- I mean, just all the things. Um, you got to get the tests. Yeah. Yeah. Because I say, true. you know, if you're, if you're not testing, especially after you're age 40, it's like driving down the road without a steering wheel or, or a speedometer. You yeah. will crash into something yeah. and you're going to go, how, wow, how did this happen to me? You got to get the tests. So do you think then, because I, I tell people all the time to get um, the cardiovascular stress test. Is it called like a CAC, cardio, the, um, the artery a, score? Yeah, it's coronary artery calcium Cor- score, the CAC right. score. That's a do good test Do you still think get. that's good? It's very good, but you can't do that in isolation. You have okay. to do it in contacts. The soft plaque is the really dangerous plaque. That's the one that causes your heart disease, your heart attacks and strokes. Got it. Whereas the calcified plaque, the reason why people think they get a high score and it's bad, I mean, maybe in the first time it is, there was a study done by Cleveland Clinic, and I have all this in the book, Jack, Journal of American College of Cardiology, and the Cleveland Clinic. And the Cleveland Clinic tells you, he says, look, they said the calcium scan is like the tip of the iceberg. What's really dangerous is what's underneath. Because what's underneath, you know, for an iceberg, that's what brought down the Titanic, right? And what they say is that whatever your score is, you have about four times as much soft, dangerous plaque then you have calcified plaque. But you can, right. the calcium score just gives you the picture of the top of the iceberg. You don't know that down underneath is what's going to kill you, is the soft plaque. What happens is, I don't know if you have time for this, but it's just a simple, uh, when you have cardiovascular disease and you have all the plaque built up subendothelial, I mean, un- underneath the arteries, it ruptures through the already damaged endothelial, the lining of the arteries, that plaque spills into the lumen where the blood flows. It goes downstream, so to speak. 
And if it goes to your heart, you have a heart attack. And if it goes to your brain, you have a stroke. Right. And it's just, you know, <laughs> that's why the soft plaque is so dangerous because the calcified plaque won't kill you. And I have all right. this in but chapter 19. So again, none of it's Daniel's opinion. It's off in the top places on the planet. And uh, so like that. Well, I don't mean to say like a great job Michael. today. <laughs> Thank you so much for walking us through your story. And you're very clear. It's your story. Uh, information about how to get the book in the show notes. But it's the Unholy Trinity. Remember that name and remember Daniel Trevor. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast. Be sure to hit subscribe and download all the episodes and leave a review, won't you? The Lisa Fisher Said Podcast is produced by ClantonCreative.com.